container pulling the packages out so that you have a you have an environment that's reproducible where you're doing your builds for packaging and then you're just exporting the actual packages so you can install those into your production environment i'm going to go over a bit um you know one of the tech major technologies of docker is called namespaces is everyone familiar with namespaces does that make sense to people can i say namespaces or is it still pretty unfamiliar i think you may have to explain it yeah so uh I'll get in. I'll, I'll explain it in, in a little bit of detail when I get to the next session section because I think it the way that um, the jail the the particular jail that I'm I'm using in Nix works it kind of highlights the features of namespaces and this you know particularly is a Linux 3.8 feature and above so we're kind of just seeing it in uh, production operating systems out there nowish but it in, it'll be the future I think of um, you know, lightweight uh, ch root. I guess this is really what it'll be replacing. Places where you may use ch root now, uh, instead using namespaces, will be the future. Uh, and then I might I, I'll talk a little bit about Conda, just in context, comparing it to Nix, because um, you know it's another competing packaging installation system. It's being used a bit in bioinformatics as well. Um, and I wanted to go a bit to explain a bit about features that it has and things that you know we might talk about with respect to easy build and features that easy build could lift out of uh out of conda finally uh we'll probably jump around a bit in our path i don't think i'll get the spec here but um at least with respect to nix and conda to understand how our path is being used there because i think that in in the uh you know the non-hpc community the use of our path in nix and conda is is getting to be pretty well known and people are, you know, sort of expecting the same ease of use in some of the HPC and uh, software installations. So, you know, talking about how we can make Easy Build use these features and when it may or may not be appropriate. Uh, so, going into Docker, you know, one of the main reasons you might use Docker is uh, is to get isolation. So. Um, you know, these run in a in a separate process namespace. So in the the Linux kernel now, if you uh, if you go into proc, um, I'll grab the I guess I'll grab where did I put. So if you go into any process ID here, it now has an NS feature here, and this NS this na NS is the namespace, and each of these. IDs represents a different namespace for each of these different uh, sort of kernel functions. The main ones that you know Docker will will take care of most of these. Um, will isolate all all of these, including the network, which is a uh, you know it's a good feature in the context of untrusted sort of uh, Docker containers. In our environments, we probably you know tend to trust the containers a bit more, so we might only want to override the mount um, namespace, which is you know what is the root file system, what's it look like, where's it, where's it come from, and uh, the user namespace is also required in order to allow the user to then become an, essentially a root within that environment without them without exposing them any uh, you know escalating any permissions back in the base operating system. I'll, I'll explain it a, a little bit in uh, when I get to the next part, but I just wanted to show you that. Is that all? Can everyone see that? I, I mean, it's a little bit hard for me to get feedback on how you guys are following along with this. Yeah, it's good. Maybe maybe make your font a little bit bigger. But just go to the URL. Yeah, I can. Yeah. And I am. Anyone who comes. Is that good? I just, I, the thing is, if I make it too big here, yeah, it's okay. let me yeah, do it okay. this way. Yeah. I'm just a bit worried that I'll mess up the web version. Sure. Anyway, I can make it maybe a bit bigger here. Yeah, that's okay. Is that big enough? Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, so uh, you, you're not going to, right now, you maybe haven't seen very much of this, or you haven't really noticed it because uh, most things have just been uh, 
have just been working, right? So where's a good example here? I have some, you know, in, in my process tree, you, you know, I have a couple Docker containers running on this, on this, uh, on this VM. So we would be able to see, uh, I can't, this is really bad, eh? PSA, exit. So the Docker daemon, in, you know, one of the disadvantages of Docker in this case is it runs as root and then delegates the permissions down. So you see the bash shells for each of the various Docker containers I'm running. So, you know, comparing the namespace of, say, this process ID. Which it versus um, a one. You can see some of the numbers changed and maybe all of them changed. So well, the user namespace actually in this case is the same because Docker is managing it differently, but some of the other namespaces have changed. And that's basically one of the, that's the, that's a kernel feature that Docker is using to, to isolate the environment. Um, you know, and then once we, once we have isolation, then now we have a clean environment. So if we want to go and you know, grab a new OS or whatever, we have a clean place to do our builds. It doesn't, you know, the, the, if we want to install any OS dependencies, we do it explicitly. Um, and hopefully we don't forget so that you, the user experience is a bit better, at least for the building side, that they have a predictable build experience. So that when they go and, you know, build something in easy build that it actually builds the first time as opposed to having to work, run around and try to fight, figure out which OS dependencies might've been installed. Uh, you know, and the advantage here as well with the active community of Docker, particularly, you can go and grab images of Fedora, pretty much any version, CentOS, Ubuntu. So you can easily grab a ch root, essentially, the environment that's already clean and working in a <clears> container. <throat> and, you know, that's a big feature of Docker, more so than the namespace stuff I said, because we can do namespaces in other ways. But being able to grab that off the shelf from a central place um, makes it really easy to to check something in, say, in, say a new version of Fedora. And I did that um, even in, in here. I grabbed, uh, I built Easy Build in, uh, in Fedora 23, because I wanted a, an example of I wanted to see, as far as, you know, libs, we, we've had some talk about G, glibc or libc, replacing it with a newer version. You know, Nix comes around as one way of replacing the whole stack. But, you know, we can just go out and grab a new version of Fedora or CentOS and just run within that. So here, pose, run. So, I mean, I've already built this, so it'll start pretty quickly. And... Uh, so we can see this, is, and then we have EB also already in this environment. We can start to build software here. You guys still hearing me? Sometimes you go really quiet, so it's <laughs> the uh, so that makes some that makes some sense. We see uh, we see first that we can, you know, grab a bunch of different environments, different OSs for us to be able to run say easy build in and then you know from the what you might be interested in next was like how easy is it to to make these environments so uh you know all my docker containers the the docker files for them are all for me in uh in github so you can go in look at some of these but primarily the docker file can you guys read this okay or is it a bit small yeah well, that's fine it's okay so I'm building, you know, I'm also building a version of LMOD to keep it separate. So one of the advantages of you know, advantages of Docker to some extent is that you can layer on the uh, the various installs. So you can isolate, say, LMOD into the environment in CentOS 7. I can go and show you that Docker file too. But really, this is, you know, sort of a simple make file, and it just runs step by step through this. It should be pretty obvious when you look at all these things that, you know, I pretty much copy and pasted this out of the install instructions from that that you know Kenneth would have put up in how to use how to install 
uh, easy build in the in develop with develop and I even used a particular version of the script that's used in uh, or that's available in the in the in the develop repository you know just go through and set up a standard environment and then you can then you you know it's finished and then you have a, you have a docker container so now that I've already done this you don't really have to do this you can just go and grab the, the container directly from the docker hub you can see I have containers for a bunch of things. Your view would be a little bit different. I think it, I'm logged in here, but the, you know, the easy build CentOS 7 is there and it works fine. And you can run this directly. Some of the, actually this, uh, this instruction is a little bit off because this is CentOS 7 now, but uh, that's available right away. And a reason you might use this, especially if you have say a Mac is then using something like Docker machine, you can go and, and jump right into a, uh, a Docker VM or a Docker container within the within the Mac, so it'll go and start a Linux VM and then shove the Docker container into that, and then you're up and running. And then the commands can work right from your uh, your Mac terminal, which you know makes your make can make things a little bit easier to test. Where you know for me, I pretty much even though I'm on a Mac, I'm only using the Linux a Linux environment as opposed to having to port it back and forth between Linux and Mac for uh, easy build installs. Um, you know, I picked Docker also because I already use it. Like I use it in, uh, I have a GitLab repository, uh, like a GitLab install. There's a really well maintained um, version of it available and, you know, getting it up and running and upgrading is really simple. Uh, so I, I preferred it for those sorts of things. So I could isolate them, they, specific, specific requirements for say Post, Postgres SQL and that the uh, it's better just to grab the um, the Docker container for me, and I, also to be able to switch between OSs. Like if your if your server that you're on, you know, it might be Ubuntu or something. You want a CentOS version, it makes it easier to jump between those. Uh, so we'll jump a bit now into our path before we get into Nix. Right, so I'm going to jump a bit away from Docker. Were there any more questions about Docker before I? jump away from it. We'll kind of see it a couple more times in tools, but uh, that's as much as I was going to talk about Docker specifically. Okay. So I questions about questions. Docker? I think I may have some questions for you, but I'll, we can do it after the talk. It's more with respect to what kind of privileges you need and what kind of effort you have to put in to actually make it work on different systems. Because this, this seems like a, a very good way of if somebody reports an issue like on Arch Linux where Python 3 is the default, this seems like a very good way to very quickly get into a similar environment as they are and start figuring out what the hell is going on. Problem. Yeah, well, I, the that's true. That's absolutely true. I think that that it's. I mean, the problem is you got to find somewhere you want to install Docker, <laughs> and that seems to be the resistance, right? Just getting the base, the system where you have root on it that you're going to put Docker on. You know, on your Mac, you can use Docker Machine, but I think that a lot of people ha are resistant to installing it for whatever reason. It has some network messiness and that. Okay. But yeah, on, on a local laptop, it should be fine. On HPC, it's probably because the query requires uh, root privileges. Yeah. And uh, even you can use sudo, but uh, there is possible to, um, to access uh, host system uh, with appropriate Docker uh, parameters, so it's uh, it's not a good good way to go on, on Linux cluster. But for uh, for local laptop, it's it's okay. Actually, I believe that until recently, and then I met the shifter. Somebody mentioned it this way. Uh, it's, it's it was presented on uh, supercomputing. Yeah. Yeah, I think shifter could possibly be a solution to this problem. I yeah. yeah. Don't, don't they re-implemented uh, re Docker for uh, HPC. But how is that called? I'm not sure that Shifter is that much lighter than Docker right now. Not, not I mean, it's specific for HPC. Well, they're not lighter, but it's, uh, it's more uh, You cannot use in HPC environment uh, something that requires root privileges. Uh, at least not. Uh, no, no, I know, but this is, the thing is, is, there's another way to solve that, and it's in. It, I'm going to get to that in Nix, which I think is, you know, shifters like a. It, maybe they'll take advantage of it when we get to new enough kernels. But in kernels newer than 3.8, you'll be able to just grab a namespace as a user, without requiring root. You can go get a 
a namespace where you have uh, sysadmin capabilities, which gives you essentially root within that namespace, which is a little bit weird, but uh, doesn't escalate your privileges in the in the root namespace, but allows you to do things that are like root, like mounting in the container or in the in the namespace. I'll say container because it's essentially the same thing in this case. So, so is that when I'm, Docker will take over an HPC? Uh, well, I, I mean, or, or it could be, it could be Shifter will do it, or, or Shifter will implement that as well. I mean, it's not, it's not, the thing that's nice is Docker has a community. So Shifter takes advantage of that community. That's one of the big things. With the added, I think that they're targeting to make the, the network work, you know, like make all the specialized uh, InfiniBand and those sorts of interconnects work properly within the container, which can, it, that's a little bit, a little bit messy right now, but I think the shifter still requires root to get it installed. It doesn't require root as once you've got it installed, but Docker doesn't either. I mean, you can per, you can permit a user to start containers after you have it installed, but the Docker daemon runs as root. But uh, Docker doesn't have yet uh, the, the implementation that. Really, that you don't need to, to, to run it uh, as, uh, or other way. Uh, aren't you able to gain root privileges with uh, Docker right now? Because uh, right now, uh, as far as I know, you always have the possibility to gain root privileges and access the host system uh, with, uh, with Docker. I think that's hypo user, I think it's hypothetically user. true. I don't know. If it's practically no, true, it's not it's, supposed to be true. It's built in. It's uh, not a bug. It's a feature. You can that you access, can that you can ask. Act. You can access the host system with appropriate parameters, like you are a root on the host system as user on the uh, machine. Bug. That's not that's that's Docker's not supposed to allow that. I mean, it, it's a Docker doesn't isolate the mounts very well. But it's, I mean, the intention is that it's a secure container that you shouldn't be able to access root on the, the host. This is feature that you can, with appropriate parameter, you can access the host file system. This is built in. It's not a file. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. a feature. And I don't want it uh, in HPC. That's the reason why I'm saying that Docker isn't, uh, isn't, uh, prepared for HPC. Uh, I, I need to find uh, which which parameter it is, but uh, I, I have Well, I mean, if you pass a, if you pass a volume in to the container, you'll have permission, you'll have permissions on that volume, but I don't know whether you can escalate them. That's a good question. I like I, I guess that maybe you. Yeah, I guess you probably do have permissions to escalate there. Yeah, I guess that's. I mean, I, it's I it's mount, a bit of a. I can mount a host file system as uh, uh, as a user and uh, access it uh, with uh, privileges. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is solved with user namespaces, right? Like this is something that Docker went away from using just straight namespaces for all sport, sorts of functional reasons that. Uh, Yes, don't make sense for HPC. So I think that like what I'll show in the next um, namespace part is a better way because it doesn't it doesn't escalate those pr those privileges and that you know it works it would work better but we you know you need to have something that that has the whole package and maybe Shifter's that I'm not I just haven't played with Shifter in an environment in a, in any environment yet I don't know if anyone else has anyone else played with Shifter. No. Uh, not yet. No. Okay. Did you check okay. Pablo's question, Rob? Yeah, I see. I, it's, it's getting. Where did he say? Um, what happens if you share containers on the same kernel? Well, that's what they do. Yeah. Or all the containers. What about? Sure. I mean, that's kind. Of, that's a point, right? That's a feature, yeah. Because otherwise, you have to do your you're in a you're in a virtual machine, right? So this is a lot lighter than a virtual machine. The advantage with the, you know, sharing the same kernel means your memory namespace, is uh, you know continuous. So there's no there's no problem. You can limit them using C groups, 
in that, but there's no problem with like the memory balloon that you would need with KVM in order to move around memory if you want to over allocate memory. In Docker, it's trivial to over allocate memory. Or, you know, you can see the whole memory. You can see the, the same memory as the, as the host. I, I hope your wife is home, Rob, because we're hearing your. Well, we have a nanny, too. Yeah. <laughs> the shotgun mic's not working well enough. <laughs> I would have done it from work, but the network's brutal. So is that enough for for Pablo? Uh, maybe he has the same problem with the kids right now, so maybe he's not around anymore. Yeah. Um, and then the question about do I manually create uh, containers? Um, yes and yeah, yes and no. I guess like I, I uh, the way that it's scripted as far as the easy build develop container. I would be able to just trigger a rebuild and it would automatically pull the newest develop. That's just because I'm just using the, the script and the build. So it's no, it's just a button. Um, as far as say LMOD, I specify the version in the download. So I'd need to upload, I need to update that as I went along. Okay. It's not, uh, well, you would have different, you'd have the same kernel, but different libc. I mean, it's isolated as far as uh, environment. That's something Pablo is asking there. So you would have, like, it's totally isolated as far as libc. And I, I think that, um, I mean, we, we show Nix as well in their jail. You'll see a bit of how that can be taken advantage of. Uh, okay, so I'll jump back to presentation. Where am I? So our path. Um, you know, I, I was at a, a discussion with the Compute Canada folks, and uh, Easy Build was one of the systems they're considering. They're already using LMOD in uh, in Quebec, and uh, one of the contributor, or one of the staff at at Calco Quebec, is using Easy Build for part of their environment. But there, you know, there's sort of a a lot of different people in Canada that are kind of all wanting to work together, and they're talking about our path as being the main solution for library dependencies. So, you know, the module file at the point where you have our path, is it just setting the path and a few other variables? I think that, you know, it would simplify module files quite a bit. And I guess Robert might have some feedback too about how they use it in attack as far as our path, because there are pathing some things outside their hierarchy there as well, right? Yeah, you must have seen the mail I sent to, uh to Maxim, right? Yeah, he forwarded it to me because, yeah, he's. I, I, we need to talk together. It's more efficient than having emails forwarded back and forth. But, but, but yes, yeah. but, um, well, what we, yeah, we do for things that are not in the hierarchy. So if you're building, for example, um, uh, HDF5 requires uh, SZIP and, um, and Zlib, and so, we just R path those guys in. Well, S if we build with HDF5, but uh, if we need to, we just R path in uh, Zlib or any other thing like that um, to avoid having to do a module load on those pack those things. Yeah. So that's. I mean, that's. It's it's inter It fixes you to a version of that, which is probably fine in your environment because. You just you support certain R path libraries you're going to link to, right? Yes, and there's no there's no magic. I mean, in other words, the problem is if we re ever remove a package. I mean, we try and mark it in the RPMs, but there's no things will just break if we remove the you know the R path library. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, that's one of the, and, and it, it's interesting you say Zlib there too. I mean, we treat Zlib a lot like a, you know, just a basic, uh, a basic library and easy build that it's kind of in, in, included everywhere. But, you know, one of the things that's kind of happened with Zlib recently is that there, there's a bit of forking going on. There's a couple of different versions available out there. And one of the advantages of if you're using LD library path is you could easily swap in two versions that have the same ABI, but different different uh, optimizations as far as their um, 
as far as taking advantage of hardware features. So they've uh, they've updated Intel has has hacked uh, Zlib to use some hardware instructions. Some of the SSC 4.2, I think, where they have the a few extensions that are related to crypto, but some of them also speed up Zlib. So I did in. Uh, I don't know if anyone's really played with those. We haven't really included them in in uh, Easy Build yet. But I was playing around here with. Uh, uh, where are we here? So it, it, it does make it, let's say, a little bit less convenient if you want to swap it in different Zetlib, but it doesn't block you in any way, right? Especially with Easy Build, you don't really care. Just well, but it does, if you used our path, that would be the thing. Well, if you used our path, you get the one you linked it with. Yeah, so, you, you just with these builds, who cares? You make a new easy coffee with a different zealot, you do the thing again, go out for lunch, and when you're back, you have the five different builds out there to play around with. Each of them behind a different module, so you can't screw up easily. And if you're then doing our path behind the scene, okay, fine. But it doesn't make a big difference to me. But it's not lots of but does, that, does anyone think that there's a problem with that, or no? Like, I, I mean, I mentioned to... <laughs> Maxim, I mean, he's not here to defend himself, but he said, like, if, if they did that on all their software, they would just run out of space. You mean our path? Uh, yeah, because, well, well, I mean, or... Building every possible version. Building everything, because you're going to have to have another binary for each of these. Like, sure. if you just want to replace one underlying library, you're going re to rebuild this big package for every underlying library? Well, so the, the, that's what you would do if you were playing around with things, but in the end, you're going to pick one, right? I mean, that's the point. You have to pick one. But you're, you're probably going to pick the one that Intel optimizes. Or unless there's a better okay. one, and then you pick that one. But while you're experimenting, it doesn't limit you when you're experimenting. And if you're really concerned about space, I, I, I don't think we, as, as a site, really concern ourselves about space. If we run out of space on our app fast system, we'll just buy more disk. Well, but, but we have yeah. because we have local disks. Yeah, for that it's very different. But we do hard files. Yeah. Apparently, it's not a big issue. Yeah, but yeah, we're not making. But I mean, it's it's essentially no different than if you said load Zlib 1.8 in your um, in module file. It's exactly the same. But they don't you just don't have to. Have they don't use our path for. They don't use a par, our path for everything either. Like you're not using our path for Open MPI. No, of course not. Right? No. But then you're... Well, I don't... That's you say of course not, but that's the default yeah. now, right? Why Why not do our path for APIs? No, it's not... It just okay. doesn't work? Or? No, no, no. It, we're talking about two different things. I'm talking... So for us, we're in the hierarchy. So you can't... So the wrappers do our path things in. In other words, when you use MPI CC or... Whatever, it's our pathing in the MPI libraries automatically. Okay. Um, but we don't explicit, you know, it's just because that's the way the wrappers work. We're not, we're not um, doing things. So what that means is, but since we're in this hierarchy, we, you know, that whole change, you know, which we get rid of that, you know, we get rid of Advantage 1.9, that removes the entire tree. Yeah. 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 Now, what I, what I think what happens is if we have to patch, let's say 1.9 is broken and when we're staying with 1.9, there's a, there's a patch for it, I think we have to rebuild everything that's 1.9. Because we have no magic, no symbolic links, no nothing. It just hasn't, I don't remember it happening so that's, that's an so I, I, Even if you use our path and, and you really want to mess with it, you can just simulate. You can. You can well, you it. could create a sim. You could create a link farm. Yeah. Yeah. You can just trick it into using something else. It doesn't. It's not because it's hard coding a path that you actually can control the path. Right. But if you wanted to do it in a manageable way, you'd want to have everything. You'd want to have somewhere that you were going to do those sim linkings, sim links, so that it would be predictable. What? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I mean, it, like, just to show, you know, I was just here as far as loading, you know, SAM tools and then move the SAM tools Intel. You know, I did this just with with EasyBuild this morning, uh, which is a modules only for the second one. 
help the Z live Intel. This is not showing up on your oh, no. screen you're sharing. Just hold on a second. I can see you playing around in the terminal, but not on the. Yeah, that's better. Uh, I think it's just a problem with the. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, can you see that now? So you can see that you know swapping the the different all it's only swapping the Zlib library, and that's kind of that's kind of neat as far as uh, taking advantage of LD library path. Yeah. You know, and this is something you wouldn't be able to do as easily with with um, our path. And you know, depend depending on what who you consider your users, this may or may not be a problem or a feature. I know that at some sites the users actually do want to be able to do this kind of stuff too. Like they're they're you know maybe experimenting with some of the libraries below. They like that they can just swap out libraries underneath and uh, change behavior. So that's uh, you know a bugger feature depending on the 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 type of users you have. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's a lot. The um, so I mean, this is just going over the packaging again. We've done this a couple times, but uh, you know, you can see the output of how the packaging's wor working. So one of the advantages uh, with using Docker for packaging, jumping back to Docker briefly, is that this the uh, the root path that you're going to use is uh, it's just within the container. So you don't, it doesn't pollute your host, your host machine. You can just spec, it just pollutes the container, and then it has an output, and then eventually you're going to install it into production. So that's one of the reasons I build RPMs in containers. And then uh, just to show, I have a a script uh, that runs within the container that makes it a little bit easier. So I can run just a command line from my host, and it goes and runs. The container essentially Docker Compose, and then this being it's a Docker Compose uses a YAML file that's in the root of the this tree, but it goes and it'll go out and build these two uh, tool chains. Out, try to try to as much, as fast as possible. It'll it'll uh, yum get the ones if there are some of the sources if it can avoid having to build it all, and then it'll build whatever's left. So uh, that's how I do that part. And then I was going to, from here, I was just going to jump back into the demo window that, and then uh, show a bit of Nix now. So I showed a little bit of the packaging in, in Docker just to, to give some idea of how we're doing that. Um, this, because of the way that Nix is working, sorry? Yeah, I don't think it's a question. Okay. So, Okay, I just heard some noise. So the um, can you see this? Okay, no, actually no. It's showing up on the web. Okay, now it is. Now. Yeah, it just doesn't. <laughs> it's because of the way this is working. It doesn't. It is optimizing oh, to oh, not. Oh. It's not uh, refreshing windows I don't have open. So I have that the. That's not what I'm looking at. So it's not refreshing it unless I go look at it. Anyway, so here's what a Nix. Uh, what they might call, I think they call it a derivation. So this is basically like a combination of um, like an easy config and uh, pretty much an easy config. Like you would do a lot of a lot of the uh, what would be our easy blocks are done in these functions like build Lua package. So they, you know, you you specify all the metadata like where the files coming from, uh, home pages, stuff like this, and then it'll go out and grab them. And build them. So, uh, if you haven't seen Nix before, it may be a little bit confusing. I think it's one of the, you know, slight disadvantages of Nix is that their um, DSL is a little bit unfamiliar to at least people with kind of a C background. I think it's supposed to be based on Lisp, but I don't know Lisp, so to me, it's yes, really foreign. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see here I've built easy build using in the Nix environment, going out and grabbing the, the packages from, sorry? The web sharing thing is refreshing. 
Please for me. This one. Is that better? Yeah. So yeah, we can go, well, I mean, maybe if I, ah, leave it. All right, so we can go and uh, see this. So then all that to say, you know, once you have these derivations, they're in your config. So this one's in a local config. Then you can go and uh, nix and I, uh, something like easy build. I'm not sure if that's going to. Yeah, I don't even know. That's the other, like, to me, it's a bit, I, I find it really weird, the name, like, the, the specific name that they put out for what you need to call it is, since it's sort of like a namespace, they add a bunch of things, like, they would automatically generate derivations for maybe a newer version of Python and an older one. So, uh, yeah, it can be a little bit weird, but you'd be able to go out and do maybe this. So I didn't do very much because that's actually already installed. But uh, that's the, the basically what it'll do is go out and build anything that's not uh, not already installed. It'll use sort of a hash of the configuration so that in that derivation, it'll use a, a hash of that to say whether or not it's the same. So whether or not it has to rebuild it. So if I made any changes there, if it would rebuild it or not. And then we'll output the the final uh, the final environment into the Nix store with the prefix of its hash. So with this particular one, we're able to grab this is a a full root environment that uh, it didn't work on. So now what I've done here is. They have a, a Ruby script that sets up that namespace, and I've jumped into a isolated namespace in Nix. So now all of the libraries that are in lib are all linked to the store version. So there's no there's no there's no OS libraries anymore. Now oh, yeah, the terminal. I, maybe if I Maybe if I make it, it'll update faster this way. So uh, can everyone see the the list of this? I was getting some complaints about it not refreshing. So you can see that all the libraries that are linked are all sim linked into the Nix store versions. We can help. Sorry? We got no shared screen at the moment. Ah, uh, OK. Sorry, thanks for that. Yeah. So we can see each of these libraries are all the symlink versions. The same with user lib. So this is, you know, their their feature for taking a Nix like environment, which everything would be specifically linked to the Nix store version, even within another OS to turning it into an environment where Nix is the root of your of your jail. And this is using uh, their user end. So um, so they have an ERB script here. And uh, And you know this is the this is the the magic here of I don't know how easy you can say that but you know with newer versions of the Linux kernel being able to unshare the user space the and the namespace in order to create a different mount namespace and make these calls all as a user so you'll see when I was here back in the in the shell. I'm just a regular. I'm just a regular user, and I can go into this this jail. It's remounted 
well, the mount command's not even there because it's not installed. It's not, you know, it, and it, it even if we go back to look at the the derivation or the, or the you know the specification, you specify each of the things that you want there. So a lot of even regular tools, if I didn't need it or want it or specify it, it just it won't be there by default. It'll only put the things in that are uh, that I specified. So I have in this example, I do have LMOD loaded. Um, you can see it's kind of in this weird path and grabbing the core modules there. And then I have uh, this slash easy build um, directory, which is from my the home directory. I created an easy build subdirectory there. And then that's that's um, mounted again under there. So you can see it in the root. Just it gives an output place that I can install packages or whatever and be able to load things. This is not 100% functional by any means. I, I kind of just did it to as a as a as a show or a toy. So you know, in in the in the easy build world, um, I don't know if I can object dump the. I don't even know what's a good library there. Um, so any of these, any of these uh, libraries will all be our path back to their own specific version. So a, an example of, um, well, I don't know what's Lua here. Doesn't even have Lua. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which. Um, there's some good, but you can see. Yeah, I don't. It's and because the L mods of where it's store aware. Yeah. So it's actually able to grab the. I forget which um, object dump I need to see the R path. I don't know if that's even. Anyway, so that the R, these will all be R path. All the uh, all the binaries in the in the uh, Nix namespace are all. So they've mounted the Nix store in this environment. So everything that's in my Nix store is available in this, but only sim linked in are the ones that are relevant that I've said in the derivation that I want to see. So that's kind of the Nix way of doing things, which is a little bit different than. Definitely different than how we would do things in uh, in an HPC environment, where we're often relying on even the OS eight libc in that. You know, in this in this case, you know, libc dot a has been replaced by the store version of of the Nix store version of libc. So everything here, it's libc libc two point two one. Which is uh, isn't fairly new, but it, I mean it's interesting to note that it's not the it's not the newest. I mean Fedora twenty three actually has a, a newer version of Libc. So Nix, despite you know moving being pretty active, moving ahead, it's still a big deal for them to shift their Libc forward as well because they have to rebuild everything for for Libc. You know one of the one of the things that Nix so in your in your environment. It replaces your. Uh, it it adds itself to your path. So now things that I have, uh, that I installed with Nix, like things like the Nix env are in this binary directory in this profile. This this profile that's here can even it, it even be user spe specific. So this one's linked to the default right now. But if as a user I wanted to install something that wasn't in for the whole system, it would create its own. And own uh, a version of the link farm just for me, so that you know that idea that we talked a little bit about. You know, you could have a link farm somewhere where you would put all the libraries in it, and then our path into those specific versions. This is kind of, I mean, Nix our path to the Nix store, but it manages this link farm. That's one of the things that they that they really do pretty well. Um, and as well as jailing, providing jails. They do. They have a ch root jail as well for older kernel versions, and then there's this newer one, namespace. So uh, is that clear as mud to everyone as far as what Nix might do? I don't know if you 
has anyone looked at NICs otherwise or had anything that they saw as far as HPC features of NICs or places where we'd actually see NICs? There's a, there's a paper on using NICs in the HPC environment. There's actually a talk on it at FOSDEM as well. In the dev room we are co-organizing, co so that should be... It's a lightning talk, though. Um, but they have, they have a paper on it, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. They, get, they have some good points on why NICs may make sense in an HPC environment. They're missing some aspects, though, but it's pretty okay. So the, the main thing I'm wondering is, if we want to use this, and maybe the, the jail that Nix supports, um, would this be a good way of us to test easy build, easy configs in and make sure we, we have all the dependencies, uh, stuff like this, and, and even to just have like a, a uniform test environment that if it works there, that's the first step and only then we start testing on real systems? Does, does that make sense at all? Well, how, how hard would it be? I don't... <laughs> I don't think it's strictly necessary to use their jail. I mean, there might be some features of their jail that are that are interesting, especially the way that they manage their Nix environment. But you know, with the like I showed in the script, it's not that hard in newer kernels to build your own mount environment. Anyway, the problem is finding which libraries you want to include. From the easy build perspective, you know, building easy build on top of Nix makes it easier because it's going to handle setting up an environment that it contains the, the dependencies you want. Uh, you know, the alternative as far as, you know, maybe like kind of what um, that Synergy did where it goes and tries to guess what all the libraries are, or maybe we set a, a, a specific list of libraries that we want to include. We can do that with a, with a namespace, like a mount namespace without really using Nix at all. But the, the good thing about using Nix would be that once we figure out what kind of, let's say, base set of libraries we want to have in the jail, everybody who wants to, to test easy configs could use that and we could agree on a common base and other stuff we handle through easy build. Yeah, it, sure. it would be a good, it's a first step. I mean, it would be a way of getting started with it without as much work, for sure. Like, we'd be able to leverage it right away. Like, I, I mean, I have it all there. I mean, we could run easy build right now. Like, the... Yeah. The FHS easy build, it's on, I have this on GitHub. You can go and install Nix, install this, and then run it. I mean, it's worth noting that, um, you know, Nix will install as a user, but it likes, it likes root as well. Like uh, Nix has some funny, they prefer to build as root uh, to, in order to support multiple users in order to control the environments and that. It depends on what features of Nix you want to use. It'll it'll also install as a user, but they that's not their typical environment. And also if you if you don't install in slash Nix slash store, then you have to recompile everything for whatever destination it is that you want. So one of the advantages of Nix is that you can it'll it'll automatically grab a binary package of something rather than building it if it's if it's in a path that's standard Nix store. And it'll go and if the hash matches something else, it'll go and grab it off the internet rather than build it. Okay. So, uh, so basically, you need root access on whatever system you want to run Nix. Unless it makes it a lot easier, yeah. Yeah, unless you want to make it hard on yourself. Okay. Like if you do. But but Docker root, well. So you know, this just goes and down. It just downloads all this stuff. Docker. Sorry, I gotta. I'll show that that. With Docker, yeah, you need root as well. I mean, this is a problem, right? Because you, yeah, yeah. it depends on what you want to optimize for, right? But, but that would be solved with the Linux 3.8 kernel? We'd be able to create a namespace. I mean, you still have the problem of populating it. But, uh, you know, you could have a tarball or, you know, Debian. You can create a, a tarball of a root environment in Debian pretty easy. That's one of their bases. And I guess that RPM actually has that as well, that you can build a a basic, like a, a bootstrap environment where you can grab the all of the base RPMs or, ba or uh, base requirements for Debian into a, into a tarball. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what about Conda? Sorry? 
about Conda, Anaconda. Oh, Anaconda, yeah. Uh, so I was just going to show, so you can see the R path here. Someone on uh, IRC helped me. But uh, there, you can see like it's R path in for the glibc library, or glibc specifically in Nix. So the Vim that I installed on this VM is uh, linked into the to glibc that's provided by Nix. So you can see the R path there in the in the output. Can you guys see that? So Conda, um, you know, it j jumping back to the the high level. So here we have in uh, three files that are available that are required in order as the recipe yes the conda recipe there's a bat version which is the windows version of the build i guess i mean i i generated this one they have a way of turning a pypy install into a into a conda based install so their meta yaml is the is what you would expect the metadata You guys see that okay? So you have mm -hmm. things like the, you know, the requirements, the run requirements and build requirements. These are very similar to, to easy build. And then it does have some testing there, some things that by default it's grabbing out some things. I don't know if it's use, if it's using metadata from the uh, from the from PyPy or if it's building this dynamically, but I'm just looking at the init files. Yeah. So anyway, it. it you know, it's it, it, from a from a syntax standpoint, it's a lot more familiar. And you know, the whole build is just this; like, it's nothing really to the to the build. It's just running Python set up install. So now, once we have uh, something installed with Conda, I mean, the big the big advantage of Conda. So I've installed it. In my home directory, so it, it'll it'll relocate very easily into any directory in your system. Can, can you and you again, you put the. Sorry. Can you switch your browser to? Oh, sorry. So it'll you know you have your bin path here that has uh, a bunch of interesting binaries, perhaps, and even like their own version of Patch Elf. You know what the main feature the main feature in uh let's see if I can actually right, so they're only setting an R path in uh but the main feature is they're using origin to find the relative location of the libraries. So wherever you installed that binary, it'll go and find the library local to that to that install so that's a i mean the, the one of the big features of conda is relocation and that they expect all their packages to be able to be relocated and provide hooks for you to be able to to run a script if it needs a script to relocate the the packages after install so I mean that's the that's the big difference maybe between say Nix and and Conda just to to highlight two different systems that are using our path. Nix is our path specific to the store and very specific to the version like it's even going down to the specific installed version whereas Conda is less specific but allows for relocation. So it's specific to its relative install position, but it allows for relocation of that whole root directory. So installing this as a user is is uh, not a problem at all, because you don't need any root permissions at all for Conda. Is that helpful? The, yeah, the, the origin thing, is that something we should worry about when implementing RPAT support in EasyBuild? It's something we talked about with uh, with Todd, for sure. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting feature you know, and it's it's more of a problem with, um, it's m more of a feature for packaging, say, than it is for easy build. In, you know, easy build itself, we can in, we, we build the things, we know where they're going to be if we're building them into their final destination, but for packaging it and want to be able to move it, it's kind of neat to be able to just say, well, you can put it wherever you want, and the package that we upload 
so I can make a yum repository and I have in these in the container that I have here somewhere. So, but it, it doesn't hurt to use origin, right? I think you would want it, no? Because it, if we build in wherever we are in our build space and then we install, like, isn't it a bit, you, don't, you don't necessarily know what happens in an install step, right? You know what happens that, in a typical install you mean, you step. Mean, yeah, you mean you you link with our path during build step and then you copy stuff out and then you break? Yeah. yeah. So you I mean, you want to be careful, especially for packaging. Yeah, when you're copying, packaging, something like that, that's that's definitely the time we'd care. I mean, if as it is right now, I don't think I think most sites are kind of relying on parallel file systems, right? Yeah, but even then, you have to be careful. Like, like we have our apps file system where all our, all of our installations are is assembling to somewhere else. So you have to be very careful that either the sibling is always resolved or never resolved. So if you hard code the our parts in them. I don't know if it resolves siblings, but then if we have another cluster and their demand point is different, then yes, we're still going to have trouble. So even though you may not be explicitly moving stuff around just by mounting differently or pointing the sibling somewhere else, you still may be in trouble. So doing the origin thing, I think if we're going to look into our part support, we might as well make sure we get the origin thing right from the start. I think it's definitely something we should make as an option. Yeah. Yeah. If you the, don't, you uh, would still be able to disable it, but it should work in both situations, I guess. But you're, yeah, like, I guess the Conda, you mentioned they have some scripts sometimes to relocate stuff. It's not always trivial to relocate things, right? I mean, the Rbox thing, just changing the origin is probably the easy part. Well, it, it I mean, it doesn't it doesn't require any scripting at all. It's the it's the difficult thing that requires the scripting, like where you're, where you need to change some script files after you're done because they. I mean, but it's up to in Conda, it's up to the person that builds the package to make it relocatable. That's their. That's their rule, I guess. Yeah. Our part works for binary, but what if scripts have hard code? Yeah, for scripts it doesn't it doesn't solve it for scripts. Yeah, the, we already have that issue now. Yeah, the, the Intel compilers, for example, have the source compiler for us, which a lot of people use once they're installed and have a fixed path. Yeah. Even yeah. that one some sometimes really uh, resolves the full symlink path. Yeah, yeah. So we have symlink with slash us that starts with slash ups, but they're different uh, worldwide where slash ups comes from. Yeah, yeah. What we once so I think three or four years ago we moved our apps file system to a different location. And we, we did some testing and actually not not a whole lot of stuff broke. Because we don't do our path, we have LD library path everywhere, so there, there was, wasn't a lot of hard coding of paths in there. One of the things that broke was R and all libraries still worked. But if you installed a new library, that broke because somehow that was still trying to go to the old path. So R somewhere, somewhere hard codes or remembers where it was installed. If you then just move it somewhere else, it still works. but all the stuff breaks inside. So that there are certain Yeah, I mean, it's, sim that... it's similar to with Perl in that, right? Because it sets the, in some some of the scripts that Perl also installs, it'll set the location of Perl in the... Yeah, the yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the, the thing, the last thing I guess I could show just for fun is that the, uh, you know, in, a, in the container when I want to be able to install the tool chain, So once I've installed it, I upload it to I uploaded it to test three. So I have the repo there, and then I can just yum install a bunch of these easy build, easy built packages. And it just makes it faster for me to get into uh, an environment that's useful. Because for the most part, we don't want to rebuild when we're in a clean environment. We don't want to have to rebuild the easy build tool chain. We want to rely on it just being available. So using RPMs, we're able to put them somewhere centrally and that people can go out and grab them. So, you know, from both the Nix and Conda perspective, binary packages are available. Something like this would, if we wrapped easy build and allowed people to go out and grab some package, RPM or something else, it may make it faster for them to get up and running 
but you'd probably have to you'd have to be you not just probably you would have to be careful about opt-arch general or generic to make sure that the builds are all specific to are all generic enough that they'll run everywhere you know and this is the big feature of easy build over nix or conda because they're both relying on installs where the stuff's compiled not optimized for the local architecture optimized for a generic architecture That's, what, that's another reason why they don't make a whole lot of sense on HPC. Yeah. So, I mean, I can take questions, but I think there, you, we've had some discussion here, too. So. Yeah. yeah I think this, this, was, this was great. And it was recorded as well, except for the first minute. <laughs> yeah. So. Thanks a lot for doing this. Okay. And I don't know how Are we done for... I don't know how hard it is to share the slides, but... Uh, but their web page, I'll leave them there. Yeah, okay, we'll just link to them. And we'll, we'll make the recording available as well. And if you go, to, oh, that's the other, the last the, the last thing, if you go to the root, um, like the ev.air.ca, for now I'll leave it. It's, uh, this loads in your browser a, uh, a Docker container that uh, you can use to play around with Easy Build. So uh, that's just there for uh, sort of some fun. And I'll, pro I'll leave it up for the day, but I'll probably tear them down at the later on today or tomorrow. Was there uh, was there anything else? What else are we streaming today, or is this the end of the? In terms of streaming or in terms of talks, this is the end. Yeah, we're just going to do some hands on stuff here. I can leave the stream on and just share my screen again. That might be useful for others. All right. I will have the well, I'll probably, I might head in. I'm going to head into work, I think. Yeah. Make sure you join, make sure you join the group dinner at 7. <laughs> the group dinner. <laughs> We'll have a I can virtually talks. I can virtually eat or watch you guys eat and starve. Yeah. <laughs> hey Rob, I I've got a fix for the PS and stuff. I'm gonna make it so that it won't configure if you don't have PS. Yeah, I think that's probably the right way. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.